Good afternoon, everyone. If you are joining us in the room, uh, please feel free to jump into the chat and uh, introduce yourself. Let us know where you're viewing from. And in about one minute, we will be underway. It's good to have you with us. All right, well, why don't we go ahead and kick into gear. It is terrific to have you with us on a Tuesday. The first Tuesday means uh, the Early Efforts webinar from the Hunt Institute. My name is Dan Worry. I am the Senior Director of Early Learning here at the Institute, actually coming to you from the, uh, the offices of the Hunt Institute today in Cary, North Carolina. For those of you who may be joining us for the first time, we are an education policy support, uh, primarily to the nation's governors and state lawmakers founded in 2001 by Jim Hunt, who served four terms as the governor of North Carolina. The Institute supports education policy all across the uh, education continuum from prenatal on up through post-secondary, but once a month we gather uh, in this space to talk about the earliest part of that continuum, the uh, years of early childhood. So glad to have you with us for an important conversation today. The U.S. Early Years Climate Action Task Force has recently uh, been hard at work really over the past year and has issued their final uh, set of recommendations and action plan uh, related to climate and young children. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to hear uh, from uh, representatives from the uh, panel itself. We're excited to be joined by Diana Rauner, who is president of Start Early and was also the co-chair of the, uh, the Climate Action Task Force. Elliot Haspel, who is director of climate and young children at Capita. And Erica Phillips, executive director of the National Association for Family Child Care. It's great to have all three of you with us today. Before we get going in conversation, uh, just a couple of housekeeping reminders. First, uh, as always, we uh, we uh, make closed captioning available for our uh, early efforts web series. So if that is something that would be helpful to you, you can find the closed captioning controls down at the bottom of your screen. Likewise, we will turn things over to your questions a little bit later in the hour. And so if you've got questions for the panelists, invite you to drop them into the Q&A function. Uh, please not in the chat. Uh, you'll see the chat can go kind of quickly. So if you drop them into Q&A, we'll know that they are questions for the panelists. The other question that we get uh, routinely, and I always want to remind, uh, is, uh, you know, will this webinar be recorded? It will. And uh, like all of our webinars, we'll end up on the Hunt Institute's YouTube page here within the next couple of days. Uh, if you want to find this uh, session or any other, if you uh, just visit the uh, visit YouTube, uh, search for Hunt Institute, and our account will come up, and you'll be able to find this and lots of other uh, great sessions that we have held in the past. So with that, why don't we jump into a uh, conversation. Diana, maybe we start with you as the co-chair of the of the task force. Really interested to um, hear maybe a little bit of background on just where did the where, where did the where did the task force come from? Uh, who is on it, and and what are the what are the challenges that the group was hoping to um, to address in its work over the past year? Well, thanks. I'm honored to be here, and really glad to have the opportunity to share the work of the task force with um, so many. Um, I will say, I think that the uh, I don't I don't think that any of us need at this point to ask where climate change is coming from because we're living through it um, daily and. Certainly the heightened awareness of the fact that this is the context in which we will be doing our work for the foreseeable. And so um, understanding that this is a space that has received and is receiving a tremendous amount of, of um, attention, really trying to understand how um, two very distinct bodies of work, two very distinct um, fields might start to talk to each other. And really importantly, um, clearly, uh, uh, child care and early childhood and um, preschool and home visiting 
the um, the early childhood field cannot avoid climate change. It's we're it's we're living through it. But quite honestly, I'm not sure that the climate world has really thought that much about early childhood. And what we really wanted to do, and frankly, my motivation in um, agreeing to co-chair was because I really wanted to ensure that uh, the early childhood world and the context of the early childhood world had sufficient attention in the climate change world, um, where there's a lot of talk about polar bears, but not always about four-year-olds, um, where we know that there's been very significant investments in the Inflation Reduction Act and in other kinds of infrastructure, but not a lot of focus on how are the people who are most affected going to get to the resources. So my um, priority really was trying to bring those um, those two disciplines together and start to have a conversation. Um, and that's really what we started to do with about 20 experts um, from the early childhood and the climate world, um, learn together and begin to explore the intersections in our work. Diana, thank you. And Elliot, I want, I want to turn to you as well. You know, your your role at Capita as, uh, you know, climate and young children uh, obviously implies a, a real connection to this work. You know, as Diana started to unpack, I think, you know, uh, the, the topic of climate change is, is probably not an unfamiliar one to many of our viewers, but maybe the connection really with, with early childhood um, is, a, is a bit of a new one where maybe we haven't always drawn uh, explicit connections, Diana. I love that uh, you know the the polar bears uh, versus versus four year olds, but um, but there really are some some very strong uh, and important connections. Elliot, help us to help us to make that that connection. What is the what is the link between climate change and early childhood? Yeah, and thank you also for for having me. I thank you everyone for being here. So Diana said it correctly. Climate change is the context. It's the context of early childhood. Now it's the context of the literal and figurative air that young children and every child being born is breathing, and that has really serious implications, both for children and their families, child and family serving systems, communities writ large, both as threats and also as opportunities. And so. Just so briefly, you know, threats wise, so young children, especially those zero prenatally through age eight, have a distinct physiology and a distinct psychology, even compared to older youth and certainly compared to adults. So, uh, you know, things like air pollution, uh, which can be enhanced by climate change, things like extreme heat, uh, the, all of that young children are uniquely vulnerable to in ways that affect their development moving forward. And so if you think about that idea that those sorts of effects are going to have influences on the development of young children's brains and bodies, and you think about any goal anyone in early childhood has, whether that is school readiness, whether that is child health, or whatever the goals are we're looking for, all of that is implicated by climate change. Climate change poses significant and concrete threats to those goals. So, so that is right. We can't you know, not think about it anymore. Um, again, similarly, we know and very tragically that, that climate change has real impacts on childcare programs, uh, whether that is disruptive effects like uh, you know, HVAC systems going out in extreme heat waves and so programs not being able to serve uh, the ch children. Uh, to things like climate enhanced wildfires, you know, it's an incredibly tragic uh, fact that Lahaina in Maui lost more than half of their licensed child care programs in the wildfires over the summer, including, uh, you know, as I was sitting with one of the, the people from there in at the Alliance for Early Success Conference recently, and she was talking about one of those was a Hawaiian language school that was rededicated to preservation of the Hawaiian language, and that's gone now. Uh, and so, you know, again, we can't separate them out, and then communities writ large. Uh, you know, suffer when you know the child and family serving systems are no longer able to function. So I'll briefly say on the on the opportunity side, on the other hand, oftentimes if we do think about children with climate change, we think about children of the future, and they are. But in the here and now, we are living in, a, in an era of disrupted climate. And things that we would want to do and need to do to make our children and our families and our systems strong, resilient, ready for the climate era are things that help everyone. Uh, you think about something like shade, right? If we know that children need access to nature, we know there's extreme heat waves now, we know therefore you need to have really good shade. Well, 
the only people who benefit from shade aren't just kids. Everyone benefits from there being lots of shade around. Everyone benefits from strong, uh, you know, from good access to parks and, and green spaces. Everyone benefits from streets that are not choked with air pollution. So in a lot of ways, when you go in through the lens of childhood, you can be an incentive. It can be a catalyst to making the kind of changes that we need in general uh, to combat the climate, uh, to combat climate change and to live in the climate change era. Elliot, thank you. And I'll remind you again, if you have questions for the panel, please feel free to drop them into the Q&A function down at the bottom of your screen. And I want to turn to Eric Phillips at NAFCC. Eric, I should, I should mention that you were not personally uh, a member of the of the task force, but the organization was um, was represented. But I want to give you a chance to respond a little bit to some of what Elliot's um, describing here. Obviously, you are working closely with family child care providers and uh, the families that rely on those uh, those services all across the country. How are they adapting their their practices to better address these these concerns right now? Thank you for inviting us um, here to talk about the impact on family child care and just really the, the visionary work that went behind trying to bring the early years front and center in the climate change conversations. And we've been really proud to be a part of that. Um, we are certainly on a journey of better understanding how climate change is driving some of the experiences currently being felt for family ch child care and the families in their programs. Um, as I was reviewing the report, I paused on this idea um, that the same children and families who have unequal access to early childhood services and supports are also the children and families who, be, who will be disproportionately harmed by climate change. And this includes um, communities of color, low income, urban and rural families, historically disenfranchised populations. And I pause there because one, it is important to name this to ensure that our communities who are going to be um, disproportionately impacted by this have targeted resources and support. And I also wanna remind us that these communities are also full of social capital, mutual aid networks, existing communication networks and assets that we tap that we can tap into. And I started there because that's really the ethos behind family child care, which is leveraging the assets that we have, leveraging um, those strengths and approaching challenges. I mean, we're no stranger to challenges um, in, in family child care and really the ECE sector um, and the way in which I see family child care educators approaching uh, addressing, um, preparing, dealing with climate change um, is very consistent with that. And so as I have talked with family child care educators in all country, or in all um, corners of our country, I hear about the impact of climate change all the time, even if it's not explicitly named. Um, there are family child care programs that have navigated the extreme heat, preventing children from being able to go outside, um, or closing their programs if they don't have adequate cooling systems, the heavy smoke from wildfires impacting the health of the children in the programs, um, flooding from storms. Um, so there's, there's definitely a significant impact. And I just want to share two stories that really stood out to me and their adaptations that um, they, they came across in order to make sure that they could continue to operate. The first was actually invited to be a part of the task force listening sessions. And I would encourage everybody to go and listen to those sessions if they have not. But she is the president of the uh, Florida Family Child Care Home Association at the time. And she was hit really badly by Hurricane Ian. Um, you know, the challenges began even before the storm because family child care Educators don't have a lot of time to wait in long gas lines and stock up on supplies. And so that was the preparation was difficult. And then once the hurricane hit, I mean, she had roof damage, um, playground equipment that was broken and missing, shade trees were lifted from the house. She had an overhead uh, shelter that was damaged and safety fences, just a whole number of um, 
uh, issues that she had to contend with. But even with all of that, she only closed for four days and reopened to care for the children of first responders who were going, you know, immediately to really repair the community. Um, she, of course, had to come out of pocket quite a bit for the expenses, um, but she networked with community agencies, um, the state in order to share resources, to make sure that providers were helping each other um, in her leadership role. She also had just a wonderful way of bringing the children back into her program and um, giving them tools and language to process some of the, the trauma that they had been through. Um, now she has a updated emergency checklist that she's shared with um, the, the providers and her association across the state and um, really has adapted uh, in order to make sure that she's she was prepared, but that she's even more prepared going forward. Um, the second story that I'll just briefly share to kind of uh, highlight another aspect of what we experience in family child care. Um, we had a listening session with family child care educators in uh, Southern rural communities, um, not focused on cl climate change, but there was a educator from Alabama who um, talked about being in very rural communities. Families have to travel very long distances to get to work. And she's one of the only child care programs, and she knows that the parents of the children are sometimes hours um, away. And one afternoon, there was a storm that got really bad, and there were tornado warnings. Um, her house was spared, but it's really lit a fire in her to have um, to become a storm shelter um, so that the children or any other anybody else who is near her would have shelter. And so... Um, on the positive side, I think as uh, as communities are grappling with plans to address climate change, um, child care, the infrastructure um, that is already there can really be something that we can leverage in order to help communities be responsive. Can I build on that? Because that was a really important um, part of our uh, of how we wanted to frame the report. Um, it was really important to us. Clearly, one thing we wanted um, our partners in the climate world to understand is the context of early childhood. The fact that these are, for the, for the most part, um, individualized providers working out of their homes, that they don't have um, a lot of resources to you know, repair and, and improve their facilities to mitigate and adapt to climate change. But the other thing that was really important, and you know, a story that we did hear from the listening section that really came home to me was from a, um, a leader of a, a child care network in Northern California that was very badly hit by fires. And, um, and she spoke about the importance of making sure that she actually could keep track of where her families were and uh, make sure that everyone was safe, that everyone was housed. Um, that, and in fact, that the authorities didn't actually have access to some of these families. And I think it really speaks to something we really tried to articulate in the report, which is that early childhood, the infrastructure of early childhood, as stressed and as underfunded as it is, is a huge resource in communities because it is often the most trusted resource, the most, the, the, the connection for many, many families who are not part of the, for example, the public school system. We clearly saw this in COVID when we knew that families really were, th that, that their childcare was their, was their lifeblood and their connections. Or we know from our work in home visiting that sometimes home visitors are really the only established agency that's reaching and connecting with families. And that resource in times of crisis, in times of climate crises, um, is such an important part of the um, resilience of a community when it comes to dealing with climate emergencies. And yet, um, in many cases, um, uh, disaster planning um, or, or climate change planning does not include early childhood representatives. So one of the most important recommendations that we're making is really you've got to bring early childhood to the table so that um, it is so, so that um, it can be part of the solution because it's such an important resource in communities. Absolutely. And I want to I want to flag for our uh, viewers that I have dropped into the chat the uh, the link 
to the uh, the website that houses the the group's report. And as you, I, I, I suspect you're already picking up on it in in the conversation here. But um, and Elliot, maybe you can help to to unpack this. You know, I think one of the things to me that was most interesting about the report, I think a lot of times when we read about climate change and uh, and, and and think about actions, we're thinking primarily about mitigation strategies, right? Things that we can all do to help to reduce carbon emissions, for example. But the report gets really tactical um, in terms of um, what what you call climate resilience and climate adaptation uh, as well, this sort of uh, disaster planning that Diana is talking about. Help us to unpack those two, those two terms and, and um, Share with share with the viewers what what do those mean and and then what do they mean sort of in practice um, in terms of the recommendations and in terms of what families and providers might be doing right now. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great great point, Dan. And you know, I think at this point in the climate conversation is fairly decent consensus that there there's a false dichotomy between kind of mitigation, which is as you say, like reducing emissions, and then that adaptation. Um, because we need all that we, we need to be reducing emissions, but also if we went to net zero emissions worldwide in the next five minutes, we would still be dealing with tremendously disrupted climate systems. We've, we've sort of passed the point where just stopping the emissions is gonna, gonna do the trick. And so therefore we need to be prepared. So adaptation you know, refers to changes that you're making because of the, the, the disruptions that you know are coming. So, you know, and that this is, we understand it's another context, right? Like you, uh, here in Denver, we had a, a lovely pre-Halloween snowstorm. So everyone blew out their sprinklers, right? So that like that was an adaptation. We knew it was coming. Uh, and then, you know, the idea of, re of resilience building or just is really this idea of, okay, when you take that blow, like, can you basically get back up again, you know? And, and can you continue to move on? And we know lots of different factors influence both adaptation and resilience, but that's kind of the thought is that our systems right now, um, are they were not designed for, nor are they prepared for, in many, many cases, the climate change era. And so there are very practical things that we need to do. Um, you know, speaking of family child care, there was a report some of you may have seen um, from the Low Income Investment Fund a couple of months back where they looked at flood risk and um, basement apartments in New York City. And they found, you know, tens of thousands of programs, you know, are, are under threat. Uh, and then, of course, that was shortly followed up, unfortunately, by an extreme precipitation event in New York City, right? And so we've got these disruptions that are coming, but those are things you can actually do. You can make, you know, basement apartments more resilient. You can, so that, the you know, you can level out yards so that water isn't running down into basements, right? You can upgrade HVAC systems. You can, to make sure they can withstand heat domes in the Pacific Northwest. You can make sure that there's good, um, you know, emergency management plans, as you say, so that when something happens, like the wildfires in Hawaii, they're they're ready to go, and programs can start serving uh, the the first responders without worrying that they're going to lose their licenses. So there are some very tactical and very practical things that can be done. And as Diana points out, part of the real challenge and part of the whole idea behind the task force is this has been so neglected. Um, I think uh, you know our last thing I'll say is, in some ways, it's because it's hard to get your arms around the early care, the early childhood systems, right? Schools, there are 100,000 of them. There are like 13,000 school districts. They all have a central office. Like they're a little easier, I think, to interface with, but because of how diverse the early childhood sector is, it's gonna require a different kind of strategy, but we're, we're past due on coming up with those strategies and tactics. And that's one of the things that as we've been trying to take this report on the road a little bit, we have, try to think about um, and, and suggest ways that states and the federal government can support getting invasion, Inflation Reduction Act money, an enormous amount of this is a like life-changing amount of money, huge investments in adaptation that um, how they get sort of that last mile to, um, to Erica's um, um, partners is really, really the question. And what, what kinds of supports, what kinds of systems, what kinds of intentional things are going to have to be done so that we know that the people who are serving children can, um, can access the supports, again, to mitigate moldy basements or broken HVAC systems or, or, or shade. Um, these are the things that every program needs. And we know as early childhood leaders how important it is that children are protected and safe 
The other piece I'll, I'll say that unfortunately we don't have a lot of data on, even though we see this anecdotally in our programs, um, is the health effects and the behavioral health effects of climate change on very young children. Um, there, the EPA issued a report, and what was striking about that was the absence of information about um, uh, um, uh, very, very young children and, and pregnant women. And this is, again, a space where there just isn't enough data. There hasn't been enough research. We don't have, so one of the other things we called for in the report was actually a National Academies of Science report on um, the health effects of climate change on um, pregnant people and very, very young children. We don't have that data yet. So again, very hard to quantify the, in, the impact, even though from where we sit, we know how important it is. Anna, can you talk a little bit more about those health effects and, and in particular, those behavioral health effects? What, what's, what's the connection there? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll just speak, you know, from our own experience at our Educare School and um, our Educare Schools across the network. When the um, when the wildfire smoke moved uh, across the country and created dangerous conditions for for everyone, but particularly for very young children, we had um, programs that couldn't let children outside for two weeks. I don't know about you guys, but if you've seen a kid who hasn't been playing outside for two weeks, it's a little tough. To, um, for, to get those children to focus. So an incre a tremendous rise in behavioral issues just based on the fact that children can't play outdoors. But the other piece of this, and the thing that, again, we heard from during our tax for task force listening sessions is the mental health issues here, the, the, the issues of parents' fears and anxieties, understandably, in not being able to protect their children, what that means for their children, the fears that children have about um, health uh, about climate experiences that they've lived through and the trauma that 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 um, it, it, um, that that creates and then actually dealing with the downstream effects of that so what we know is that there are from a um, uh, what, what what we see in our home visiting programs is parents who don't know how to talk to their children and how to make their children feel safe and who feel themselves unsafe and are and traumatized and are therefore less able to be um, uh, to be uh, responsive and um, and protective of their own children. Thank you. Again, want to encourage you to drop your questions into the Q and A. We'll get to them uh, in just a couple of minutes as we as we go on. You know, another thing that I I really um, found important and interesting about the report is that it does a, a nice job of highlighting uh, some equity questions in this in this space. I mean, as Elliot has sort of unpacked that, you know, that young children may be more susceptible to some of these, um, you know, climate change variables than adults, even in some cases. But we also know, uh, I think, safe to say that that certain young children, uh, depending on their resources and their, um, you know, their own individual communities may be placed at greater risk. Um, than others is that is that a, a fair assessment and and if so who are those kids and what what makes them more at risk i'll throw that out to, to all of you i could start there yeah i mean the unsurprisingly sadly given the country we live in uh climate threats do uh sort of layer onto structural inequities and and racial inequities. And so some of that is very literally geographic. So in terms of if you look at what parts of communities tend to have stronger stormwater infrastructure versus which ones were built on floodplains, it's not surprising who which populations were shunted into one versus the other. Um, some of that is the legacy of a whole lot of um, planning decisions. So again, if you look at the the stats um i need to drop the exact number because i don't want to misquote it but something around 40 percent of um of children of color live within like a mile of a source of industrial pollution it may be higher than that and it's something the contrast is something along the lines of like 15 percent of white children it's again those are not the exact numbers but you can look at things like uh, proximity to industrial pollution, uh, proximity to uh, a park, you know, or high quality play area. You can, any of these uh, areas you can look at, in almost every place you're seeing um, these inequities. And we you know we've seen this on city levels too, right? Whether that's the neglect that led to 
uh, the water crisis in Jackson, Mississippi, and Flint, Michigan, right? And any of all of these issues are are enhanced. Climate, in some sense, is a climate change. In some sense, is an inequity multiplier uh, that just continues to um, to layer on. So there are, are tremendous uh, equity considerations. I think just about anywhere you look, and so that's another you know reason why I think as a field that is, is very interested in. Uh, thinking about equity issues and trying to to be a force for good in that way, you know, this is another reason why we need to be caring about the intersection of the early years and climate change. And I would add on to that um, the from the provider angle and the early care um, our field, there are tremendous inequities in just being prepared and um, having an ability to respond to climate. Uh, related incidents. And so there, we know that there are ways that we can equip homes and facilities to be more prepared, whether it is um, changing your drainage, um, being more energy efficient, um, uh, having air purifiers. Many of these require significant upfront investments. And, you know, I would be remiss in saying in early care and education, we don't have extra money um, to outlay um, what's needed for this. And so really thinking about getting some of those significant grants and dollars to early care and education programs is important and in an equitable way. So how do you do it um, where it's available in multiple languages, where the application process is you don't need a forensic accountant to actually apply for something where it's it's some with thing that somebody who might be caring for children full time is also able to apply and benefit for, from it. And so I think that's just another level of equity in, in terms of making sure that those places um, that might be in, you know, high zone areas or, or um, vulnerable areas are able to access the funds um, as other sort of larger institutions and, and um, businesses are able to do. And that's really going to be at the end of the day, how um, how successful some of this work is in terms of reaching um, early childhood, because we know, as with other large public investments, the, the we can't not only can um, child care providers not uh, afford to do this. They don't. They don't even have the mental space to start. You know, applying for funds. I mean, really, when we went um, to present this um, th this plan to our um, our leaders in Washington, one of our recommendations was: you need navigators. You need somebody who's going to go. You know, go house to house with a with a laptop and help people apply for this money. You can't send them to a website and expect them to navigate and get through it. And you know, it'll be interesting to see how successful that is because without that level of support, um, it's always going to be the the most resourced that get the money first. I'm glad you I'm glad you brought that up, Diana and, and Erica. I think you you said so nicely as well. Something that I've been thinking of. I mean, you know, we're talking about um, individual childcare providers who may need to make. Um, you know, facilities, renovations, we're talking about low income families who, you know, may themselves lack basic resources. I mean, we know that, the, you know, the child care industry generally is sort of, you know, hanging by a thread uh, financially. Um, so this is this is not a time that you know, that either, you know, high risk families or the, you know, individual child care providers likely have the bandwidth or the resources to, to take on some of these mitigation, um, you know, uh, plans and, um, you know, resilience and adaptation plans on their own, which I think really leads then to the question of the, you know, the policy recommendations that, that come out of the report. What what would you share with with viewers about you know what are the what are the sort of tactical recommendations uh, that the the task force has made uh, to state and to federal policymakers in this space? What do we need to do next? Well, I do think that you know again we've we've seen um, for better or for worse with some of the ARPA and Gears funds that without really intentional leadership at the state and county level. The dollars will go to again the most institutional players. They will go the, the you know it's kind of like water. It's going to run into the deepest grooves, and most of those are school districts, um, uh, institutional providers, large, sophisticated organizations to get really the resources 
distributed in an equitable way is going to take um, intention and intentionality um, in terms of at every level. And so um, moving from the federal to the state approach and thinking again about some of the resources and, and, and child care resource networks, but also the kind the ways in which um, we can intentionally support the individual providers, the community-based organizations, those who have the least access to institutional supports, um, and not make sure, not send all the money to the school districts with the ex ex expectation that, oh, well, that's where the kids are. Because actually, no, the kids, if you really know where they are, are not in those places, especially the very young kids. Um, and I would add to, you know, there are <laughs> literally dozens and dozens and dozens of, of recommendations in the, in the report. So definitely encourage folks to check them out. The, the website that uh, tries to make it very easy to navigate, but I will say from this conversation, so part of it is yes, we need to have more resources flowing. So there's lots of call outs for, you know, climate funding needs to be, you know, does it have early childhood set asides in it? Do we know that there are other dedicated facility improvement funds that are available? Because part of it is expanding the pie. And climate, you know, folks on the climate side will say, and they're probably true, they don't have enough funding there. But I think relatively to, to the early childhood sector, there's some decent money flowing. Uh, and so to be able to tap into that, I linked in the chat to a report Start Early did with um, our friends at the Aspen Institute uh, around the early years provisions in the Inflation Reduction Act. There is stuff in the bipartisan infrastructure law. But, you know, to Diana's points, it can be hard for that to be accessed. So some of it is, is it accessing the resources that are there. And some of it is making sure we can use the resources that exist maximally. So there are uh, recommendations in there around making sure that CCDG, CCDVG funds can be used um, for facility upgrades. And I will note, as one is very concrete thing, uh, the state plans are going to come up for renewal in 2025, and the work to renew them will start um, next year. And so that's potentially a place you know, to make sure that states are thinking about as they come up with their CCDF plans. Uh, to make sure that there's climate provisions in there. So, you know, there are some very concrete recommendations about drawing down funding, and some of that also is in governmental structure. So, early childhood is so siloed, uh, from other parts of child and family serving systems, and also certainly from environmental and climate issues. So, at every level of government, the task force called for the creation of more intergovernmental, um, you know, work. So work groups, whether that's literally appointing a person, like a, a you know cabinet level person who's thinking about this at a state. So we, it is going to require, as Diana said, leadership. Um, and the last thing I'll say is something that we talked about earlier is getting the early years to the table, right? So to make sure that when these conversations are happening uh, about city, state, you know, little adaptation plans that the early years are part of that and that they're, the, the, again, resources are being put where they're most needed. And important as, you know, as Erica mentioned earlier in the conversation, not, not only uh, for sort of childcare in and of itself, but, uh, you know, the, the childcare is an important part of um, preparation for, you know, disaster planning for states, right? The, the, if, if child care is not available to first responders, for example, um, then, then that becomes a real, a real challenge. Let's transition into some of the questions um, from, the, from the viewing audience. Christine has a, uh, an interesting question here talking about one of the recommendations uh, is to incorporate a, a climate risk screening uh, and share those with families. She's asking, and I'll, and I'll throw out a, a little bit of a, an addition to this question. First off, what what is what does a climate risk screening entail? Uh, and her question is: Are there are there templates available? How would how would somebody go about um, putting something like that together? You want to start that one, Elliot, or do you want? Sure. I mean, I mean, I mean interesting things. I will just say, from a provider's perspective, and speaking again um, as a provider, one of the hardest parts of the. Um, of the last summer was that there wasn't really clear guidance, that there wasn't, um, that in fact, providers were kind of left on their own or searching on websites to try to figure out when is it safe to go outside? What do I have to worry about? What should I be doing? And, you know, and, and uh, for my interior air. And so in that respect, we have a long way to go before we have, um, again, really scientifically based information that can support providers in the moment and parents, because that's the other piece of this. 
parents are trying to figure out what do I say to my kids? How do I know how to, what to do in these, in these circumstances and pediatricians, I mean, the American Academy of Pediatrics has been a wonderful partner in all of this. And they've been really at the forefront of talking about the impacts of climate change on very young children. But again, there, we don't have, um, we don't have guidance that helps people through what is a, a, a situation that's unfolding in real time for all of us. So I'll start there and I'll toss it to Ellie. Yeah, I know that's great, Dan. I think, I, mean, I think part of the answer is not yet. So the report is, and the task force's work is intended to be in some ways a launching off point. And we're going to need folks who take some of these recommendations and really build them out. So what is a climate risk screening? That is, you know, a simple tool and, and similar to, we might do a well child screen or we might do a screen for postpartum depression. Like, I'm just like, what are the risks? Um, you know, like, do, is your program, you know, at, do you have a basement? Like, is the basement a risk of flooding, right? Do you have a plan? Like, what is, do you have an HVAC system that can withstand a heat wave? You know, do you have an air filtration system that's up to the standards that are recommended? It's really understanding that we are in this predictably unpredictable era and are going to be the climate enhanced threats, which are going to look different by region, right? So the risks that are happening in the American Southeast and versus the American North, the Pacific Northwest are going to be different. So they need to be adaptable, but that that's what those kind of tools are to help programs understand and to help parents understand you know what risks might be they may not be thinking about that they need to be making a plan for to try to reduce that risk. I'll say too, I think one of the underlying, you know, again, values in the report is that for better or for worse, the children of today are either going to be the resilient adults of the future that take us through the worst of this problem or not and it's and and the investment in early childhood is as much about preparing for the future and preparing those young people to lead in the future because this is the future that we unfortunately are leaving to them and so really thinking about um uh, resilience at every level, right? Resilience in terms of the physical plant and the physical infrastructure, resilience at the community level in terms of social relationships and connections, resilience at the family and at the individual level in terms of creating um, young people who can um, who can adapt to a changing circumstance and can um, communicate and work with other people to find solutions because heaven knows they are going to have to do that. Absolutely. Eliza has a, um, a a long question. I'll try to try to summarize it here. Um, she's noting that there is so much data about the positive impact, uh, physically, social, emotionally, uh, for of of children actually being outside, and that there's a you know there's an active movement right now uh, in in the early childhood space even around uh, outdoor spaces and nature based preschools. And so she's asking, does does the report or the conversations that have been had around it uh, support or advance these efforts, or is there uh, reason to think, uh, in in part, that you know because of some of this climate change, um, you know that maybe uh, maybe children are destined to spend less time outdoors. Well, I think some of the most poignant um, testimony we heard during our listing session was from um, individuals from cultures that have perhaps um, had really very strong connections to nature. And what this means from just a, a cultural um, transmission perspective, um, we heard from an, um, a leader in the Pacific Northwest, a Native American who talked about fishing and how important fishing was in his culture and the fact that that's not as much of a possibility anymore. So I think recognizing that it's, um, it's connection to nature and it's also connection to culture and that all of these things are important and worth, and worth working towards and highlight the, 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 the power of that. I agree. I think that um, the importance of playing outside and getting children outside was is absolutely a through line in the conversations. I mean, that's why, for example, um, family child care educators in incredibly hot, um, extreme heat environments are looking for ways that they can safely play outside with shade, with, um, enough uh, water and um, with materials that will not absorb heat. And so um, part of it is finding ways that we can safely have children play outside because uh, we all know how important that is for um, 
for children. Um, the other thing is, you know, we've worked with family child care educators. We have a leadership development program and they can uh, identify different community-based projects that they want to work on. And several over the last uh, few years that we've been running on this have done projects focused on um, playgrounds and gardens. And one of the many reasons that they uh, think about this is to make sure that children have safe, healthy places to play outside. Um, so, you know, it is a part of the conversation. And I think we, we definitely need better information, um, you know, probably some uh, new equipment and, and things that will be more resilient to the, the weather changes that we're, we're getting. Yeah, and I'll just add it real quick. Um, yes, so first of all, directly answer yes, there's a whole section called the outdoor learning opportunity in the report. Um, so it's definitely there. And then I'll also say um, yeah, there are some organizations that are doing great work on this, Children Nature Network. Um, I know the world, the National Wildlife Federation has a program around it. So I think it is wrapping that into this conversation. Um, and Erica's right about the, the data part. Um, so I just wanted to say, if you haven't seen it, um, Kaboom and some partners in Philly did a really interesting data visualization where they basically looked at all the learning, the early learning centers, and they looked at proximity to play areas and to green space. And, you know, to be able to get, and again, um, unsurprisingly, we have huge inequities that, that in that um, perspective as well, but that kind of data, um, I think can help spark a conversation about, which needed to happen regardless of climate change, but especially needs to happen because of, in the context of climate change and not only what does that mean for access, but what does that mean for access to climate resilient uh, outdoor you know, space and uh, play areas. And Erica led us nicely into uh, another, another question in the chat. Erica was talking about the community-based projects and uh, playgrounds. We, we talked a little bit about you know, the, the role that state and federal policymakers might play, uh, but question from the viewing audience about what, what is the role of local government in, in this work? Yeah, well, I think, um, uh, in fact, the local government may be the, the most important in some respects, because that is really where the voice of early childhood can come into planning and um, both providers, but also the perspective of parents and, and families. Um, someone, uh, I now can't remember who in our listening sessions talked about, what if we actually uh, designed the world from the perspective of, um, I think I've got this right, 40 millimeters, uh, 40 centimeters, which is about the size of a four-year-old. And um, and and what if we stop? What if we started looking at our at our development and our and our communities from the perspective of of a much smaller person? Um, that's really where local governments have some of the most important impact is in terms of designing green spaces, in terms of focusing um, and and using development dollars and bringing families and and uh, and providers, early childhood providers to the table to be part of the conversation. So I think that is one of the most important messages in the in the report. And I'll just add on to that. Um, it is something where we can have an influence on our local government and um, a uh, family child care leader who was in New York and who saw the LIFT program um, shared with our network, go to your city council, ask them to map out where all the family child care, well, where all the child care programs are at. That's something that they can do. And they can use that to layer on any other information that they might have about flooding or um, about the access to um, shaded spaces. And so uh, I thought that was a great recommend recommendation and, and something that, you know, is within the sphere of control for either our our field or um, city governments. Yeah, and I'll just uh, plus one to all of that. And I would just said there are some pretty practical things too local governments can do that we don't need the state or federal government for. Um, one the recommendation in the report is about considering creating low emission zones around child care programs. And those are um, proven elsewhere in the world. And basically you kind of like reroute industrial traffic, you limit idling, right? Like you can, you slow down the streets in some cases um, you can shut the streets entirely to, to traffic, to car traffic, and that has the result of really increasing the air quality um, and is a well as kind of creating conditions in place for more uh, vibrant communities where it's easier to walk and, and just have that access to the outdoors as well. So I think there are also some, even while we're fighting for the 
bigger pieces that need to be in place, there are these smaller, um, you know, targeted strategic actions that local governments can take. Absolutely. And, and Eric, I, I know um, on behalf of NAFCC, um, you know, the local governments in particular tend to be responsible for zoning ordinances, right, that um, in, in so many cases, uh, you know, determine uh, the the success and the availability of even family child care. So I would imagine um, that that some of the you know some of that local leadership um, you know would need to provide additional flexibility on on some of those ordinances when it comes to things like uh, shade structures, for example. Um, yes, and um, I will say because often the local zoning ordinances don't really understand child care um, and, and the facilities uh, required. And so um, often we see the opposite where some of the zoning is restricting the ability to provide, um, you know, the ideal type of environment for young children or making it um, uh, overly burdensome. And so I would say zoning, maybe working in, in connection with licensing, and of course, the early um, the, the early care uh, workforce or coalitions would be important to make sure that really we don't want, we know that there are well-intentioned recommendations and requirements, but they have to be funded and they have to be done um, in a way that is accessible for a child care program. So really that balance between um, what is required and how do we support people to get there. Several, several questions in the chat that maybe I'll try to uh, conglomerate here that uh, I think, uh, you know, the, the conversation around the community navigators um, really seems to have struck a chord in the in the chat. Several um, questions relating to uh, difficulty that providers have had in accessing grant funds, for example, or when when public funds is available. Uh, sort of back, I think, Elliot, to the the comments that you were making earlier, Diana. Maybe it was maybe it was you, but talking about the you know how the large chains and school districts um, tend to be better equipped to. It, frankly, even even complete applications um, for some of this funding. And so Esther is asking whether there are examples of uh, collectives, child care collectives that maybe advocate on behalf of um, really equitable uh, distribution of those public funds. Well, I think that's actually one of the key roles of um, early childhood advocacy. And certainly it is in the states where we work um, to ensure that dollars are flowing um, to those who are uh, who are on the front lines, who are to, to community-based organizations, fighting for um, fighting to ensure that dollars don't just go to the local education authority and sort of stop there. Um, I think that's a really critical part of of our advocacy work, and I also think certainly CCRNRs and other agencies can be really important advocates there too. I'd also just add to that, I think this is an interesting place where philanthropy could get involved, because uh, mm -hmm. even our TCRNRs and other hub organizations are usually, um, you know, a strain on their capacity. So I would say, yes, it would be a really good idea. No, I do not think we have enough of them, of those sorts of, you know, collectives or organizations uh, for this issue or for other issues. So yeah, I think that's a great idea. And these especially so you two things I think that's one and then for advocates too to be pushing on the state and federal government to make the app that funds and the resources more easily accessible like some of these hoops to jump through are just unnecessarily difficult and i would just add on to that um the uh community development financial institutions so like lift the cdfis um i've been really impressed with their ability to be able to get out large um amounts of money with relatively low um hurdle i'm not sure if that's across the board um but for some of the partners that we've worked with they've really done the relationship building they have gotten the information out so that you know those who really will benefit the most from that funding um, will. I mean, I think there's still it's still to come because a lot of the uh, funding is still um, being allocated, but that those are some of the the best practices I've seen. 
But just, you know, to another comment in the chat, I think um, one of the things that we certainly have advocated for is guidance from the Office of Head Start and from ACF on how um, funds can be used and even blended with um, Inflation Reduction Act funds so that um, providers can make important facilities upgrades. And uh, and, and that is sometimes as, as, as much about, you know, sometimes you have to ask and sometimes it's helped to have some guidance that leads you to those answers. Um, I want to throw in a question for Matthew as well. You know, we, we talked about how very young children may be you know, physiologically more susceptible uh, to some of these uh, markers of climate change than, than older children or, or adults. Matthew points out that uh, there is another population, those with, with disabilities and special needs, who may be even more susceptible and is asking whether the uh, the report made any sort of um, the considerations or should make consideration uh, to children with disabilities in this case. I think that's a space that is wide open and still needs a whole lot of work um, without question. And um, and clearly it, the, the, the space of early childhood and disabilities is so wide open, but this is a space that we have a lot more to learn. And I think it's a place where where Honestly, I don't think the report really had the opportunity to go there, and I think we should um, absolutely. It's it's an opening and a necessary place that needs more work. We are running up against the top of the hour, so maybe one last question that uh, that maybe each of you can respond to briefly. Obviously, we have a a, a sizable policymaker audience that always tunes in on these on these calls. What what closing guidance would you have now, having gone through this? Uh, the task force process. What would you? Uh, how would you advise a, a state lawmaker, for example, who is tuning in today, uh, in terms of what you think maybe the most important next steps, uh, and 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 how they might use their sphere of influence to to help to address this question? Um, Diana, maybe we we could start with you. Sure. Well, I think from the very beginning, um, we have tried to underscore the point that this should not be about making more work for an already overstressed industry. And that the goal here is not to make um, uh, early childhood providers worry about more about climate change and what they should be doing, but rather to focus the climate world on what how it can support very young children through the early childhood industry or system. Um, and so I, I guess where I would say is, there cannot be one more requirement. There actually needs to be more help. This is obviously a time when we have seen through the um, last three and a half years, um, an industry that was in crisis before turning into deeper and, and, and darker crises. And so the last thing that we want in, to do in any of the writings or any of the re recommendations is to put more burden on this industry, but rather to shout out for more attention, more resources, more supports to help the industry manage through this context. Erica, what would you what would you add? I would add that our um, sector, while we are incredibly diverse and um, have many different settings represented, that we are here, that we are willing to be allies in the clim climate planning work, um, and that we are uh, people who have great relationships with families and communities and should be a part of climate action plans. Um, and the, the second thing that I would say that any changes like responding to climate related crisis or um, having to comply with you know, great policies around climate change, if they don't come with additional funding, this will absolutely result in the loss of more childcare programs. And so just reiterating we're here. Um, we want to uh, make sure that children are growing in healthy environments and um, we have to have help in doing that. So that's what I would share. Elliot, final word, what would you uh, what would you share with policymakers? Well, it's hard because Erica and Dana took a lot of what I was gonna say. So I'm gonna talk about something slightly different, which is I think facilities for many policymakers might be the easiest entry point. Uh, we need to have healthy, robust um, childcare and early years pediatric facilities as well for any number of reasons is in critical for climate change is also going to help us from everything ranging from if we have another issue with a pandemic down the line or infectious diseases um, to handling you know general changes that are happening in communities so 
to be able to really put that higher on the priority uh, priority list to make sure that that all children are able to attend early years facilities and all educators are able to work in facilities that are healthy that are going to be climate resilient and that are supporting you know the development of children and frankly adults as well i think that could be a really um, good stepping stone and entry point for policymakers that can lead them to the broader conversation about the early years in climate. That's a great place to, to wrap us up here right at the top of the hour. I want to thank our panel, Diana Rauner, president at Start Early, uh, Elliot Haspel, who is director of climate and young children at Capita, and Erica Phillips, executive director of the National Association for Family Child Care. Thanks to all three of you for taking time out to be a, a part of this conversation, not only today, but uh, certainly um, you know your organizations over the past year and pulling together this very important uh, report. It's been a great conversation. I want to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to uh, to tune in today and remind you that we will be back on Monday, December 11th for what will be the, the third annual uh, version of uh, what we call Big Wins for Little Kids. It'll be sort of our uh, year-end recap of the big public policy accomplishments around the country. Happy to be hosting that in partnership again with the Alliance for Early Success and also the Prenatal to Three Policy Impact Center. We'll have a, a special two-hour event. If you've participated in the past, you'll know uh, we have the, the first hour is sort of um, uh, heavy into a, a little bit larger panel than usual. We'll have uh, uh, an opportunity to sort of run through some of those big wins for little kids. And then during the second hour, you'll have the opportunity in a Zoom meeting to actually interact directly on camera with uh, with the, uh, the resource experts uh, that you're most interested in uh, pulling up and hearing a little bit more from. So please do register for that Monday, December 11th. We'll see you back uh, in the same place. Great to be with you all today. Have a good afternoon.